So just let me know when to get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our DEN Summer Speaker Series. I would like to introduce our speaker today, Steve Matusik. Steve has over 23 years of experience in the conception, design, and operations of space missions. He started, he started his career as a student controller at the Solar Mesophere Explorer mission while still an undergraduate at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, as a trajectory engineer for the Voyager 2 Uranus flyby. He stayed with the, jo he stayed with the Voyager mission for the Neptune and Triton flybys in 1989. Subsequently, Steve managed mission analysis software tests. He then provided deep space network feature loading forecasts for over 400 missions from around the world. After that, he managed the mission design and launch vehicle integration for the Pluto Express pre-project. Shifting to the Mars exploration, Steve planned future Mars missions, including orbiter, lander, and sample return concepts that culminated in many of the missions now at Mars. He is currently the mission manager of Juno. Juno launches to Jupiter in August 2011, utilizing a polar orbiting solar powered spinning spacecraft. Again, thank you for joining us today, and please welcome Steve Matusik. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, depending on where you might be. Uh, today I'd like to talk about Mars sample return. Uh, the, the things I'll talk about today are spend a little bit of time on why do we want to do a Mars sample return, talk about advanced planning that's needed for a Mars sample return, talk also about technology development and what do we have to get ready before we can uh, do sample return. Also, uh, I wanted to touch briefly on sample analysis and, and I mean that after all that's the goal of sample returns to bring samples back and analyze them. Talk about the politics, uh, what conditions are necessary to to enable us to go forward with the Mars sample return. Talk about planetary protection. And uh, I'd also like to mention a, f a few words about uh, life detection at the end. Uh, before I dive into the bulk of the material though, I just wanted to give a brief history of Mars sample return. Uh, Mars sample return was actually studied uh, back as as far as the 1960s as a follow-up to what we might do after Apollo. There were advanced studies back then. Um, also when the Viking missions were launched in the 70s and were on the surface of Mars, there were further studies. Then recently in the 1990s and since the year 2000, uh, the scientific community said we really need some samples from Mars, so there were many studies that went on in the U.S. and currently the Europeans European Space Agency is studying uh, Mars sample return for the next decade. Okay, so before you do a sample return or any mission, you really have to have reasons as to why you're going to do that that uh, mission. So why why do we want to do a Mars sample return? Uh, first off, I think the number one, these aren't in any priority order by the way, I'll, I'll go through them uh, as they're all important for why you do a sample return. First thing is the science. You really, uh, a Mars sample return is first and foremost to get the science back, get those samples, understand what they mean, um, and analyze them. The, the analysis can take years to do. Um, by science, I mean there's more than just uh, looking in the, the rock samples themselves, there's the process of actually selecting the samples at Mars. You learn a lot about uh, which, what samples you're bringing back as you're doing the mission. There's technology development. Now, as you'll see when I talk later on here about the technologies, you really, there are no showstoppers of the technology, but there are some things that, that we really have to develop. and. One, one thing that we found for NASA missions and, and other uh, space missions around the world is that as you develop technologies and techniques for doing that, there's always spin-offs. So I can't list them and say, well, here's going to be the spin-offs from a Mars sample return mission, but it is very challenging. And so uh, 
the, the engineers and technologists will have to come up with new ways to do things and that will, there'll be spin-offs. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the uh, president's vision of sending humans to the moon and then on to Mars. Uh, Mars sample return is a preparation step for that. I, I really believe that, that um, in order to go to Mars and come back with samples, you're doing a lot of the things that you have to do to send humans there. Of course, it's much more difficult to send humans to Mars than it is to bring samples back. But but the, in doing the round trip, you're, you're going to learn things. Uh, for example, uh, the spending a long time on the surface of Mars and then launching and, and coming back, uh, that's something that, that we haven't done before. And you really, on a human mission to Mars, you want to minimize the things that you're going to do for the first time. And so demonstrating these on a Mars sample return, I think, is a key, key part of this. Uh, not to be underestimated is the, the adventure of it. There, it, it's quite an adventure to go to Mars, select samples, and bring them back. I think that's a component of all space missions that, uh, that sort of drives the, the public to really want to, to do some of these missions. Uh, also a general area of just uh, exploration of the solar system. You, we want to understand what our solar system's like, and Mars is the most Earth-like place uh, besides Earth in the solar system. So we, we want to go there, uh, understand it better. There's a lot we don't know about Mars. So let's bring some samples back and understand that. And um, I put this one last to, so that I didn't emphasize it up front, but uh, you really bringing back samples, uh, a lot of people would say that you want to do that to help find or uh, help to find past or present life. And I don't think you could, could send a sample return saying, okay, we're going to go there and we're going to find life on Mars. That's just uh, a very low probability of doing it. But you're going to find out a lot about Mars. And you might there's, there's a chance that you might find uh, some past life or current life, depending on where you return the samples from. Let's talk some about the advanced planning necessary for Mars sample return. Uh, first and foremost, you have the geometry of the Earth and Mars. We, there are certain times that you can launch to Mars. They're, they're roughly 26 months apart. So they vary by plus or minus two months on the launch date and return date, depending on how good or bad the opportunity is. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, when I talk about some example, an example mission scenario later. Uh, there's, there's technology development that must be done. Uh, really, we've, we've looked at that and how long it takes to, at, at current funding rates to develop some of these technologies. And it takes about 10 years, maybe as little as six, but uh, somewhere in the six to 10 years before you're going to launch. So even if we decided this minute that we're going to launch a Mars sample return, the earliest uh, we could launch one is about 2018. Now, of course, if there's more funding that goes towards it, you can compress that schedule, but that's at current, current rates. Um, there's been a lot of advanced planning done for Mars sample return already, and currently in the Mars program in the early uh, 2020s, the, the next decade, there is a, a planning for a Mars sample return in that time frame. I think the European Space Agency also has a Mars sample return planned around then. Uh, one of the key components of this is what launch vehicle are we going to use to launch a Mars sample return? Because it, there's, there's a, it's a large vehicle, or several large vehicles put together to do the mission. So um, heavy lift capabilities are, are essential. Uh, sample return can probably be done with the largest launch vehicle we have now, the Delta IV Heavy. But uh, some of the heavy lift capabilities that we're developing for the human missions, uh, particularly to the moon, Mars sample return benefits from that. And there hasn't, to my, my knowledge, there hasn't been a lot of study of that, but it has to help. Uh, the reason that it helps is that if you put all the components on the launch vehicle, one launch vehicle, 
it's simpler and you than multiple launches. If you have multiple launches, there's a lot of different things happening and it's more complicated. So uh, you'll see that as I talk about more sample return, I'm continually stressing that that simpler is, is better usually because the mission's pretty complex anyway. And um, I think I mentioned this already, but I wanted to stress it again that some launch years are just better than others from the way that uh, the, the Earth and Mars line up. And so you kind of have to plan not just for the best launch year because being a complex mission with a lot of challenges, it may slip to the next Mars opportunity 26 months later. So, and if you've designed your mission to only happen at that best conditions, it could be a long time before you could do it and, and there's risks involved. So you have to plan for sort of, a, I would call it a middle of the road opportunity, not the worst and not the best, uh, but, but it does vary, uh, the performance varies quite a bit. Okay, now I wanted to uh, talk some about the an example uh, scenario here, or some example uh, ways to get to Mars and back. There's a, there's a trade space of of how you want to do that, and I've kind of simplified it down here to this chart. So um, I think this is okay to to point at things on the screen and it gets picked up. Um, on the left over here, we have the uh, the Earth, and that, that's, uh, that's where launch occurs. And then in the middle we have Mars, so we have launch and arrival at Mars in the middle, and then launching from Mars back to Earth. So you can do, for a Mars sample return, you can uh, launch from the Earth and then do what I call a direct descent, meaning you don't, your lander does not go into orbit, it just goes straight straight down to the surface of Mars, like all the missions that we've done, uh, except for Viking. Viking went into orbit and then sent the lander down. But uh, Mars Pathfinder, Mars Exploration Rovers, um, all those missions, they go directly down to the surface. Uh, but you could go into orbit around Mars first and then go down. There's a mass penalty you pay for that because you're putting, putting all that mass that's going out to the surface into orbit. But you could do that because you could say, well, there could be bad conditions where we're going to land and, and we go into orbit, we're, uh, we can pick the time we want to land. So those, those are two options for getting to Mars and how you get down onto the surface. Then for coming back, you can uh, do a direct return, meaning you're on the surface, you have a large launch vehicle, you launch and you you just come straight back to Earth. There's no uh, nothing else involved in that. Now that takes a large launch vehicle down on the surface of Mars. So one of the things, uh, as we, if if you look at Mars sample return in detail, you'll notice that a lot of these options have uh, mass associated with them or not. That you have to just propellant to lift yourself from one place to another in and out of gravity wells at at Earth and Mars. This one uh, is difficult because it takes a lot of, uh, takes a much bigger launch vehicle that you have to carry down to the surface. Um, you could also do a deep space rendezvous, meaning you launch from Mars, uh, but not such that you can, you'll come back all the way to the Earth. You go to a kind of an intermediate point. You, you just barely escape Mars gravity, and you have uh, another vehicle that you launched from the Earth and you rendezvous out in deep space. You're not in Mars orbit, but you're in orbit around the sun. And the third way uh, is that you could do a, what I call a Mars orbit rendezvous. This is also a mode that Apollo used, the Apollo missions in, in the 60s and early 70s. You, could, you can launch from Mars and then uh, launch to an orbiter there the orbiter rendezvous with, with your uh, capsule that you launched from the surface, 
uh, rendezvous with it, transfers the sample into the orbiter, and then the orbiter comes back, and you leave the rest of the mass back in orbit around Mars. Okay, so now we have the sample coming back towards the Earth. Uh, when you're coming towards the Earth, you can either do a direct Earth entry. Um, that's, that's been done uh, several times. I mean, the recent example was a Stardust mission that just returned uh, samples earlier this year from the uh, a comet tail. And that came to uh, direct Earth entry down to the surface, and then they picked up the, the capsule on the surface. Or you could uh, go into Earth orbit and low Earth orbit. Uh, there's been some talk also about going to, to the space station or things like that. Those have problems. I'm not going to go into detail here, but those have some problems with them because you have to then get into a particular orbit plane, and that takes energy, a lot of energy usually to do that, which translates to more mass. So you could go into orbit and then either pick up the sample from orbit and bring it down in another vehicle, or you can, uh, you could leave it up there, uh, there's a, there, then you pick it up later. It'll be in Earth orbit. So that's kind of the trade space of Mars sample return. Uh, that covers almost all the, the options. And you can do these when I talked about getting to Mars and then back, you can do that with any type of propulsion that you, you might think of. You'll notice I didn't put propulsion on the technology development uh, slide later. Okay, and w along with any good uh, system engineering of, of a mission or, or any uh, effort you're going to work on, you have to have good... Uh, requirements to start with. So I put an example set up here. It's not complete, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea of the kind of things that that a Mars sample return might uh, require. So uh, first one is, uh, of course, the the objective. You need a single sentence statement. Of you want to return samples of Mars material to Earth for storage and subsequent analysis. Uh, that's the number one requirement. I put it as the first one. And you have to decide how much sample you're going to bring back. Uh, too little sample and you can't analyze it properly. And too much sample and you've you've spent resources on the mission that, that you didn't need to and uh, that, that couldn't be a good thing. So there's been some uh, analysis done of what, how much sample you have to bring back because that's a key item in, in the whole design of a Mars sample return. And things have things settled down around 500 grams, sometimes a kilogram uh, in that range. There's enough sample there that many labs, ten, at least tens of labs on the Earth, could have a piece of it and use different techniques. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, how, how advanced techniques might change this amount of sample that you, you bring back. Uh, also, what kind of samples are you going to bring back? Uh, you could say, well, I, I'm just going to bring back samples, but uh, the science community has specific types of samples that they really need to see in order to to be successful in understanding what the samples are. So the return samples, they need to include rock, uh, regolith, which is, I, I think of that as sand, uh, wind blows it around, things like that. And then, and atmosphere. You don't want to go to Mars and then not bring back a, a sample of the atmosphere. So that provides challenges in the mission where you've got these different types of things. You know, rock is solid and has different sized chunks. Uh, regolith is like sand, and you have to, you know, if, if you had some device that could hold a rock, well, it may not hold the sand. And then atmosphere. Atmosphere is fairly easy to collect, but you need to seal things so that it doesn't leak out. Um, Another aspect of this that I didn't put on the requirements list but has been talked about a lot is do you need to preserve the temperature that the, the samples were taken at? Um, notice that there's not things like ice or water on the list. And if you 
did grab those things, you you would like to preserve the temperature that they were that they were sampled at, and that that can be difficult. But it's not on the the basic sample return requirements list. And um, as you take these samples, you have to figure out where they came from and decide which samples to take back with you. I, I think of this as a geologist that's out on, on the surface of Mars and you see many things and you say, wow, that looks very interesting and that looks interesting, but do I really want to put it in my bag that I have on my shoulder here and carry it back? Because it, um, as you select these samples, you could quickly fill up the bag and then you can't carry it back or things like that. So you want to be able to select a sample, have some scientific instruments there that's, that are going to tell you that they're the right samples you're taking. Um, also uh, listed later on here in the requirements list, you want to take a subsurface sample. So that means you have to get down below the surface. And how do you do that and how does that preserve the sample? Uh, another thing that you, you want to do as you're collecting the samples is if you see one and you grab it and then later on you see another one that's better and, but you filled up your, your mass allocation, you filled up your bag already, you want to be able to throw one out and put another one in because uh, otherwise, you know, why spend that extra time and go out and, and take a look and see what more samples we're going to collect. And for a sample return, you want to collect the best set of samples you can uh, to come back. Okay, and um, the next bullet I talk about sample diversity. Really that means that you don't want to just go one place and take samples in a very small area. Uh, you want to have a diverse set of samples because at Mars, if uh, one thing we've seen from all the missions, particularly if you look at the Mars Exploration Rover results and some of the orbiter results, is that Mars varies quite a bit in different areas. So if I go out for a short distance, I'm going to see many different things and that's how I get diversity is I have some mobility on the surface, meaning I, I don't just land there and everything within reach of an arm or, or some sampling mechanism is what I bring back. Um, there's been a lot of look at how much mobility do I need and uh, the number one kilometer radially from where you land is held up to, to some scrutiny uh, about that, that you'll pass through different regions. Uh, there are some regions of Mars where it takes more than one kilometer, but in general, one kilometer radial distance will get you a lot of diversity. And so when I say radial distance though, the for mobility you're going to have to have a rover that, that travels more than one kilometer because you're not just going to radially go out and along the way collect samples, you're going to be using a zigzag back and forth. Uh, then I talked about subsurface sampling. Uh, that, that subsurface sample needs to be from a, uh, at least one hole, could be more than one hole, where a depth of at least two meters. There's a lot of debate about this one. How far do you, down do you need to go? Um, do we need more than one? Uh, drill hole, but this is a sample requirement. Uh, and then where are you going to land? There are, there are very difficult constraints in terms of landing on Mars and then also uh, launching. So when, when you're within 15 degrees of the equator, you usually get the best power and um, the, the least amount of resources expended to land and then launch back to Mars. And also the, the altitude at which you can land, uh, plus 1.5 kilometers seems pretty doable and is consistent with uh, like the Mars Science Lab, which launches in 2009, its capability. Uh, and since Mars has no ocean, I can't put sea level, so you have to put uh, the MGS MOLA kind of base mean reference zero on there. And that's sort of the sample range of, of area that gives you a lot of places you can go uh, you can get a different set of, of diverse set of samples, but yet you're still able to do the, the mission for reasonable cost and, and resources. 
Okay, um, I've talked about the requirements and uh, some of the way, some of the trade space. Now I wanted to give you an example mission concept. Um, not to say that this is the answer to do a Mars sample return, but give you an idea of what what would an example mission look like. Um, so let's let's go through that now. You would you would launch on a uh, Delta heavy launch vehicle or bigger uh, when when the um, human mission in uh, 2010, 2012 starts uh, using larger launch vehicles. Uh, I'd say we use them. We don't need the largest launch vehicle they're talking about, but a bigger one would, would help because mass, mass in, in Mars sample return uh, helps the mission out. Um, you have a launch period of about 21 days to in, ensure that you'll get off you'll get off the pad when you want to. Uh, maximum C3, the launch energy of around nine or so. That's what it takes to get to Mars. And uh, I put an example launch mass on here, not to say that it's an exact number, but just give you an idea of how many kilograms you need. And you know it's about 7.9 uh, metric tons. Tons. That's quite a bit of of mass. So what you launch is everything stacked together in the, the launch vehicle. Uh, you have, in this, in this scenario, I, I only depict one lander, but um, I'll describe two landers, you know, because there's room for another lander. You have an orbiter and probably two landers in there in the fairing. You could go with just one lander on a separate launch, launch the second lander too, but that, again, that gets more complication into the mission. Uh, so the orbiter carries the lander, with, this is the aeroshell here, um, to Mars. And then at a certain distance from Mars, you'll, the orbiter will release the lander. It'll do all the targeting up to that point. Then the, the orbiter has to do a maneuver to make sure it doesn't stay on that same aim point because you don't want the orbiter landing on Mars. You want it to go into orbit. So it does that for the one or two landers. And... Uh, That's at about uh, 60 minutes. It could be a few hours before getting to Mars. And then the lander batteries don't have to be that, that big. If you release it earlier than that, there has to be a lot of power available on the lander. So this, this is a trade between how much capability do you put in the orbiter and how much in the lander. Uh, then the landers go to their um, landing sites. They could be close to each other, but you'd probably separate them out by by some distance, at least a couple hundred kilometers, because you don't want them landing right next to each other. And uh, then the orbiter, as I said, it goes to a different aim point at Mars uh, in, into orbit, and it starts uh, aero braking because you don't want to carry all that propellant with you on the orbiter. Because it, it turns out to be a lot of propellant that's required. And that takes... Uh, two to six months, maybe a little bit longer. So the orbiter's aero breaking down while you're already starting to do things on the surface. Uh, probably aero breaks down to about a 500 kilometer orbit, although other altitudes are. The, the trade on the altitude is that the higher you go, the more the launch vehicle has to work to get, get your sample up to that orbit. The lower you go, uh, the, the faster your orbit's changing for the orbiter. And then, um, then when that orbiter gets down into its orbit, it's ready to, to go capture that uh, orbiting sample. So uh, on the surface, meanwhile, you're, you've launched your, not launched, you've, you've sent out your rover, and you're also collecting some sample on the lander as a backup in case the rover never comes back with a sample. And this uh, object you see here, kind of upside down. Oh, I forgot to orient you on this. The, the this represents the Earth here on this uh, uh, down part, down uh, blue dashed line here. And this is Mars. So all these things up here happen at Mars. All these things down here happen at the Earth. Um, so the on the lander here, the, this object right here is the uh, Mars ascent vehicle essentially a rocket, just like you had at launch here, but much smaller because you have 
much smaller mass to launch, plus Mars gravity is less than the Earth's, about one third. Then uh, I put on here after two weeks, it, it's probably in reality longer than that. The rover's not going to go out and collect a sample. It's going to take maybe a few months. The longer you have things alive uh, with power and, and having to function down on the surface, the more capability you have to design in there. So the minimum, I think, is two weeks, and that's probably pushing it. But anyway, you, you collect your sample, get it loaded up. Uh, this, this doesn't look like a launch vehicle because I, it's a cocoon. It's, it's thermally, it keeps the, the Mars Ascent vehicle warm. And then uh, the Mars Ascent vehicle launches. It puts the orbiting sample, uh, a sphere probably, uh, into orbit. Sphere's probably basketball size at least. And that's to hold 500 grams of sample. And then the orbiter, uh, represented over here by this vehicle, and it's uh, here also with the big solar arrays. That orbiter then goes and rendezvous with that uh, orbiting sample, grabs it, and then puts it into the sample return capsule. Does a, does a burn in the main engine and it's back on its way to Earth. Uh, but, but it has to wait because uh, at Mars, uh, usually, usually, almost every Mars opportunity to launch back to the Earth, you've got to wait until the alignment happens again. So you have to wait about 400 days. I have 435 on here. That number varies from you know, 400 to 450 days. So you're in orbit waiting, and then uh, you, you, the orbiter uh, launches back to Earth. Uh, the Earth return vehicle, now the orbiter becomes the Earth return vehicle. It's essentially the same vehicle, although you've left some mass that you don't need to return to Earth back at Mars. It has a sample return capsule, which then is targeted uh, to come back to Earth, probably at Utah test and training just range just like Genesis and Stardust did and uh, comes back, lands on the surface, protects the orbiting sample canister and then that canister is what gets taken to the sample curation facility and that has your samples in it. Um, I guess one thing I, I wanted to add to this description of the example mission concept is that You'll notice as you go along through the events, there's quite a few things that have to happen. And so that's one of, the, and it, there's no simpler way to do a Mars sample return. So when I talk about the politics, that's, that's a factor, I believe, in that. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing here. Uh, so from when you launch to when you bring back the samples is about three and a half years. And there's really no way to shorten that time. Um, that's just how long it's going to take to, to do the mission. Okay, so I talked about the example mission partly as a backdrop to kind of talk about the technology development. So the first thing you have is a uh, Mars Ascent vehicle, the rocket that's launching from the surface. There's when I say technology development, let me let me back up here a second. I, as I said earlier, there's no technology development that we don't have right now that that you can't figure out how to do it. It's all things. By development, I mean in the engineering sense that you have to take a particular technology, like like a launch vehicle, for instance, and you have to to modify it so that it works for this mission. It, We've been launching things for a long time, so it's not a new thing. It's just we haven't launched it from the surface of Mars after you know it's come from the Earth and sat there for a while. So that they're not there's not any showstoppers, but that's how I'm using that's the context of technology development. Some areas for the the Mars ascent vehicle that need to be uh, developed are you have to look at whether it's going to be a solid rocket, uh, how many stages. I think two stages has, has uh, been the least amount of mass, and that's for the Mars environment. The same isn't true here on Earth. Usually you have multiple stages, uh, more, than, more than two. 
Um, if you have a solid, uh, solid rocket motors there, you have to watch the thermal conditions. You can't let them get too cold. If it's a liquid system, you have to keep it, you have to keep the propellants liquid. So there's, there's challenges there. Each one of those things takes power and, and other resources that you have to plan for. And then a uh, question about the technology development is do you need to test it um, in an analogous environment or not? To test the Mars Ascent vehicle, you can't really find an environment that's one-third Earth gravity. You can get close to the, the atmospheric conditions on the surface of Mars at about 100,000 feet here in the Earth's atmosphere, but you're not going to have the same gravitational uh, pull that you would have on the surface of Mars. So you probably need to do some testing on that, but it's a tricky thing to figure out what's the right, right way to test. Uh, sample handling. As I went through the mission scenario there, you could imagine that the rover has to hand off the samples to the lander and the lander has to hand off the samples to the Mars Ascent vehicle. And then the Mars Ascent vehicle has to hand off uh, that, that uh, orbiting sample canister that has the samples in it to the orbiter. And then you have to make sure it gets into the sample return capsule. So there's, there's this sample transfer chain, we call it, that you have to pay attention to. And it's, it's a complex movement. Um, not any more complex than the things we do on the Earth, but you have no humans involved in the loop and you have to make sure for planetary protection that you're not contaminating things as you transfer the samples. So that's really the challenge there. And you also need to keep track of the origin of the samples as you go through that. Uh, in the area of planetary protection, how do you protect the sample and, and the Earth uh, from contamination? You don't want to go, I'll talk about this more in planetary protection, but you don't want to go to Mars and say, aha, we discovered Earth microbes there. Um, then the sample return capsule, it's, it's a development in the sense that it, the size of it uh, for, the, for the mission is different, but it's not any new technology. The thermal protection system is, is traditional and, and things like that. So, but as you look at this with current rates of funding and just how long it takes to do a test and then see the results and make sure that it's everything's working properly leading up to the mission development, that's going to take about 10 years. Okay, uh, one of the, what I call one of the tenets of sample return is that it's better to bring samples back to the earth and analyze them here because the samples, the, the analysis labs on the Earth are always going to be better than the instruments you can send uh, on a mission to the surface. That varies uh, because the instruments on the Earth are always improving. The instrumentation for space is always improving too, but that's that's always going to be true is that the lab's back on Earth. And you'll be able to... to keep the samples, much like we had the lunar samples, and then there's new techniques that come along in, in a few years or decades, and you say, ah, I have these samples here. Well, let's try that on, on that. Uh, also, uh, one of the things that I've been keeping an eye on is that it's taking less and less sample uh, to analyze properly with the labs back here on Earth. So uh, the least amount of sample you want to bring that you can get by with here is what we want to bring back. And that's getting less and less all the time. And another aspect of this mission is I've, I've concentrated on the, at the space mission side, but the, the sample storage facility design is, is key here. Uh, when you bring Mars samples back, there are some unique requirements to that where you're, you keep it isolated from the Earth environment. Uh, I'd say it's it's sort of like a combination of the way the lunar samples have been stored plus some of the very uh, sophisticated facilities where they do uh, microbial research or things you just don't want to, you want to make sure it's separated from the, the earth environment. And so, and, and those samples are going to be stored for years, so that facility has to really be thought out. And it takes on the order of, of six to ten years from when you've, 
have the design for that facility, the sample storage facility, to when you're when you're ready to go for the mission. So that takes a lot of upfront work too. I, I included a picture here from the uh, Johnson Space Center kind of curation facility, not for Mars, but uh, down there for the uh, future activities. And they have a website there that's that's very useful to to look at this sort of thing. Okay, uh, let's talk some about. Uh, a, you know, I talked about mass and the mission mode and everything. Let's shift gears a little bit here and say, what what's the political environment that's necessary to do a Mars sample return or to start doing one? Um, there's some factors into that that are in the political arena. One is the sample return is going to take the equivalent of two or more uh, orbital or landed Mars missions. So the, the orbiters like we have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter there and we have other landers and rovers that are planned to go there or have Mars Exploration Rovers. It's going to take two or three, the resources of two or three of those missions to do a Mars sample return. So the trade there is, you know, we have Mars sample return with versus sending two or three other missions. So that's a hard thing to make the decision on. It's been a, an impediment to Mars sample return so far. Also from the start of technology development to when you get the first analysis of the samples is 13 years. Uh, it's 13 or 14 years. That's a long time. People have a tough time concentrating on something, some goal for that uh, that long a period. Mars sample return the, from the start to, uh, you know, I mentioned this 13 years to when you're analyzing things is going to take at least two presidential terms. And we know how things change from president's term to president's term sometime. Uh, in the current uh, funding climate, the large robotic missions are, are few and far between. Uh, so Mars sample return is a large robotic mission and, and that means there's not many of the, them that get approved now. And it's been on the planning horizon I mentioned since 1997, even before that. And really, it's further away now than it was was back then in '97. And part of it has to do with the political environment of some of these factors I talked about. And then, um, not to be discounted here, also is that I think it's perceived as a riskier mission because you have to you have to do all these events before you get the the samples back. So people say, well, it seems it seems riskier to do that. Um, I, I don't think it's it's too risky to do the mission, but it's a factor when, when people are considering whether to do Mars sample return or some other mission. So all these things combined, uh, they have to be solved before you're going to launch a Mars sample return. Just like any other mission, they, there's a political climate that has to be taken into account. I want to touch a little bit on here um, planetary protection. I'll go quickly through it. It's not my area of expertise, but... Uh, it does apply. There's international treaties that specify uh, spacefaring nations. They have to protect against contaminating locations in the solar system that might harbor evidence uh, of or current life. Um, guard against these false positives. They say you don't want to go somewhere and say, ah, we discovered Earth microbes there. And um, these same treaties also, the, they specify that sample return missions some shall not contaminate the Earth. I put a couple of pictures on here. One was from uh, the Mars meteorite uh, that was talked about, uh, I think it was in 1998, which is still a controversial subject about that meteorite. And uh, the Atacama Desert, uh, where they thought it was so dry there couldn't be any microbes, but they're, they're there now, just as some examples. Uh, in planetary protection lingo, uh, Mars sample returns designated as a Category 4C, which really means that as you enter these special regions at Mars, there are specific constraints on the spacecraft development and operations. You have to pay attention to what's touching what in those environments. And that definition of a special region is region where terrestrial organisms are likely to propagate or a region which is, uh, which is interpreted to have a high potential for the existence of current Mars life forms, and, and that usually means where there's liquid water. Um, 
really I put down here from, from an engineering standpoint, to me this means practically that any part of the land and hardware that's going to come into contact with the special region, whether it's wheels or the sample transfer chain, it needs to be sterilized or isolated. Now I want to point out here that this is being studied now and there's advisory committees and things because, because Mars sample return is coming up these advisory committees, you really need to be more specific about this, otherwise the mission it has, has such constraints put on it that it's very difficult to do. I put on a link on here that just has a current article in, uh, about the planetary protection. So um, I'd like to, to conclude here briefly to emphasize a few, few points. Uh, I really think that Mars sample return is a challenge that's within reach now. Uh, we have the technologies. We know how to do Mars missions. Uh, their Mars missions are difficult and there have been failures, but I think we've learned over the decades. Uh, I'd also just like to take a moment. I, I probably should have started with this at the beginning of the talk, but can you imagine the excitement of bringing Mars sam samples back? It would be a, a, quite an event across the world. Uh, it would be very exciting. Because Mars it always has an allure to it. People, people are drawn to Mars. And uh, maybe some of you that are uh, viewing the lecture today uh, might be working on Mars sample return. It's, I think it's in the not too distant future. So I guess uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and find out if there's, if there's any questions there. Uh, I left my, my email address at the beginning of the presentation, so feel free to send me questions if you, if you have them. Thank you.